Hello everybody, welcome to Lesson 20B. In Lesson 20 we're talking about judging. Last time we talked about who can judge. And this time we're going to go over everybody's favorite judge verse. When you ask him about what the Bible says about judging, pretty much everybody turns over to Matthew 7, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. That's what everybody tells you. Even churchianity tells you that. Oh, we can't... We're just going to love them. We're going to just show them God's love. We can't judge them because Matthew 7, 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. We talked last time that 1 Corinthians 2, 15 says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. So which one is it? Can we? Is it that we cannot judge or else we're going to be judged? Or can we judge everything? Well, last time we talked about that 1 Corinthians 2, 15 is what's applicable to us today because we are spiritual so we can judge all things. So, how do we understand Matthew 7, 1? Judge not that you be not judged. What is that talking about? What does it mean? Since I'm saying that it's not for us today. Well, first off, we need to understand who's being talked to. The uh, Matthew 5, verse 1, begins what is famously called the Sermon on the Mount. And it goes through the end of chapter 7. So the context of Matthew 7, 1 is the whole three chapters there, Matthew 5 through 7. And when you look at Matthew 5, verse 1, it says, well, you go back to verse chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Well, you know, when you do that, then the result is going to be verse 25. There followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and from Judea and from beyond Jordan. I mean, if you had somebody today walking around and they were truly healing, not like a Benny Hinn or somebody that's faking it, but someone's truly healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. People find out about that. Everybody with cancer is going to go there. Everybody with whatever it is is going to come flock to him. And that's what happened. But Jesus didn't come to just heal people physically. Jesus came, Matthew 15, 24 says, He came unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Romans 15, 6 says, He came to as a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He says in John, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus didn't come to just give a temporal, physical healing that would go away when you die. He came to give eternal life to people. And so when he saw these multitudes, Matthew 5, 1 says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So basically what we've got in Matthew 4 is Jesus going to the masses then there are people who don't just follow him for the miracles. There are people who are saying, well, I want to know more about this. I just didn't come to get my toe healed or to be healed of cancer so that I could walk again or whatever it was. I came to get more. So I want to find out what it's all about. What is his teaching? So then he's given his teaching here. But notice John 2, because that's going to be a parallel passage for us. And it's important that we understand what he, what's said about Jesus in John 2. Because in John 2, uh, you've got the same thing going. The chapter starts with what's referred to in the Bible in verse 11 as this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. That's when he turned the water into wine. So he started doing miracles right then. And it says, and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So I get parallel to Matthew 4. Matthew 4, you've got these miracles, many people following him, obviously. And so you have that here in John 2 as well, um, parallel passage. And then toward the end of John 2, it says in verse 23, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So again, that's what we see in Matthew 4. Matthew 4 He's doing all these miracles. He's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And he's healing all manner of sickness. And so all these people are following him. And so, but there are people who claim to be believers. And so what he does with them 
It's sort of like what he does in John 6. As in John 6, you've got, uh, he feeds, uh, in John 6 too, great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up to, into a mountain and there he sat with his disciples. In other words, when all these people follow him, what Jesus is doing is he's separating out the cream of the crop, basically. All these people follow him because they fed, he fed them f the 5,000 loaves and two fishes. He's doing these physical miracles. And so now he's going to see, okay, which of you, now that you've seen that the power of God is in me and then I'm the Messiah, now I'm going to give you sound doctrine. And now we're going to see which of you actually believe me. And you see in John 6 when he does all this, there's this great multitude following him. He goes up into the mountain and teaches them. And uh, then, there's, then he comes back down and more people start following him. So that's what's going on in Matthew 5. So Matthew 5, oh, going back to John 2. I'm sorry, I didn't read that last verse. So John 2, verse 23, says that when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man for he knew what was in man. And then going over to John 6, he ends up telling them uh, after he feeds the 5,000 in John 6 verse 10, uh, down through verse 14. And then, uh, the day following, they're trying to find him. And in verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. <coughs> so what he's saying is, Jesus does these miracles so that they know that he is of God. Then he gives them sound doctrine, hoping that they will believe that doctrine and be saved. They're, he's hoping that they will repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That they will stop trusting in their own religion and their own self-righteousness and they will trust in God to save them. And so that's why in John 2, when he says that all these people believed in his name, it says Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. In other words, just because he sees a bunch of people following him, he recognizes, as he says in John 6, 26, well, you're seeking me not because you saw the miracles, meaning you, you saw that people were saved because they stop believing in their own righteousness and they trusted in God to impute righteousness to them, but because you saw the loaves and were filled. In other words, you were just going after the flesh. You saw these physical miracles. You saw the, the feeding that I did and you just wanted to be satisfied in the flesh. That's why you're following me. But Jesus said in John 10, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I didn't come just to give these miracles. I came to give you life. And you're not following me because of life. So what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5, and the reason I bring all this up, is it says in Matthew 5, 1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. What that's telling you is this is at the beginning of his ministry, and you have all these people following him for the physical miracles. But Jesus does not commit himself to them, because he knows the majority of them are following because they are going for the material, the physical. They're not looking for spiritual life. They're not looking for eternal life in the kingdom. They haven't abandoned their own self-righteousness. They just see these miracles. Just like today, if there was somebody who was healing people of cancer, just doing all these miracles, physical, genuine physical miracles, there'd be thousands of people around them. People aren't flocking to the, that healer because... They're preaching a clear gospel so that they may be saved. They're doing it for the miracles. Just like here, I'm preaching a clear gospel. I preach Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. No one's flocking, beating down my door to hear that message. People are looking for the satisfaction of the flesh 
rather than on the spiritual. And so what Jesus is doing in Matthew 5 is he's basically seeing, okay, I see all these people, you say you believe in me, but I know it's because you've seen these miracles. I'm not trusting myself to any of these people yet. I'm not giving you eternal life right now because you haven't shown to me that you truly believe the gospel. You're just following me because I feed the 5,000 or because I'm giving, doing all these physical miracles. So basically what he's doing in Matthew 5 through 7, what's called the Sermon on the Mount, is he's taking all the people who have claimed to say, I'm your disciple, I will follow you. And he says, okay, you say you're my disciple, you say that because of the miracles. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you my doctrine, and then we'll see how many follow. In John 6, we read that earlier, after he gives a similar type thing, when he gives them sound doctrine, in John 6, 66, it says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. See, when Jesus does the physical miracles, thousands of people follow him. But when he talks about you need to abandon your own righteousness and abandon that religious system that you're in and trust in God to give you righteousness and trust in God to save you, when he starts talking like that, everybody leaves him except, in this case, the twelve. And Peter says, who are we going to go to? Thou hast the words of eternal life. It shows that Peter and the twelve understand that they're not there for the physical miracles. They're there for the words of eternal life. So when you're in Matthew 5, Jesus, he's got thousands of people there following him in Matthew 4.25. In Matthew 5.1, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. What Jesus is doing is he's taking those thousands of people that are following him, and he's saying, I'm not committing myself to any of those, for I know what is in man. I know that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach sound doctrine for these next three chapters. And then we're going to see who believes me. Because then when you get to Matthew 10, which of course is after Matthew 5, it's after the Sermon on the Mount, when you get to Matthew 10 verse 1, it says, When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the name of the twelve apostles are these. Verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth. See, he's not at that stage yet in Matthew 5. Matthew 5 is the early part of his ministry. He's still weaning out the wheat from the tare, so to speak. He's seeing who are the true believers, who's just following them because of the physical miracles, and who actually believes in the words of eternal life that he's given them. And the way he does that is he gives them words of eternal life in Matthew 5 through 7. But my point in mentioning all of this is to show you that when you're reading Matthew 5, Matthew 6, and Matthew 7, he's not talking to only believers. He's talking to all people who were following him because of the physical miracles. And he's saying, okay, here's the doctrine of the kingdom. Now let's see, after I tell you this doctrine, how many are going to follow me after that. That's why he says, you know, when he starts in Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 7, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, all of these things, you can see, he's not talking to people who are already saved. Verse 3, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The implication is, if you're not poor in spirit, if you're following after the lust of the flesh, you're not going to get in the kingdom. Verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The implication is, if you're not meek, if you don't set aside your own self-righteousness and believe the gospel of the kingdom, you're not going to be in the kingdom. You're not going to inherit the earth. 
Verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The implication is they're not righteous yet. These are just people who are following him for the physical miracles. That's the only reason they're following him. And Jesus is trying to separate out those who are going to believe. He says, you know, it's great that you're following me, but following me isn't all about just healings and all these wonderful things. There are going to be people, in verse 4, you're going to mourn. You know, verse 11, or verse 10, you're persecuted for righteousness sake. Verse 11, men will revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. It's a bunch of trials you've got to go through in order to be part of the kingdom of God. Verse 8, you know, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. It shows you're not going to see God. You're not going to be part of the kingdom unless you abandon your own self-righteousness, which is as filthy rags, and you believe the gospel, gospel of the kingdom in this case. That's the vein in which Matthew 7 is taught. So when you go to Matthew 7, verse 1, and he says, Judge not that ye be not judged. He's not talking to believers here. He's talking to a group of people who have followed him. Who Now, some of them are believers. The twelve are. Well, except Judas Iscariot. And there are probably some others as well. I think Matthias is there, who ends up being the twelfth disciple. Um, you know, some others as well. There's a seventy that's called out in the book of Luke. So, there, there could be at least you know, a couple hundred people here who are actually true believers out of the thousands who are following him. But the point is, he's separating. In Matthew 5 through 7, people say, oh, that's the, Christ, the Christian constitution, and this is what we're supposed to follow. Well, there's a lot of good stuff in here that you can get out of there, but he's not talking to a Christian audience. Jesus is talking to people who have followed him because of his physical miracles. They're not saved yet, is the point. You can see this if you go back to Matthew 6, verse 14. Verse 9 starts what's called the Lord's Prayer you got a bunch of people today reciting this Lord's Prayer, even though Jesus says in verse 7, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. And yet people are doing vain repetitions in church of the prayer that comes to two verses after that. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this is a prayer of people who don't have salvation yet. They, they believe, but Israel, they're supposed to endure unto the end in order to be saved. Matthew 10, verse 22, says, Ye shall be hated of all men for my, sake, for my name's sake, but he that endureth till the end shall be saved. They have to endure unto the end of the tribulation period in order to get eternal life. Now, of course, tribulation period is put on hold, so... Uh, really, they endured till the end of their lives, having faith in God uh, to save them rather than their own righteousness. And so then God gave them eternal life in the kingdom, even though tribulation period hasn't happened yet. Um, but that was the requirement back then. It was, there's going to be a lot of deception and deceiving out there. Jesus gives them clear doctrine in Matthew 5 through 7 and tells them, you believe this, then you follow me into the kingdom. You have your trust in what I tell you rather than trusting in your own righteousness, rather than taking the mark of the beast or worshiping the image of the beast when the Antichrist comes, and then you will have a place in the kingdom. To see that conditional salvation, to see that they haven't had it yet, all you have to do in the famous Lord's Prayer there, when the prayer is ended in verse 13, you go right into verse 14. You know why, why, In other words, why are we praying this prayer? Why do we pray the Our Father prayer? Is the question, because verse 14 starts with four. You know, verse 13, when it says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People close the book. They got memor verses 9 through 13 memorized. They don't know what verse 14 says. But verse 14 says four. Four means like therefore, or because of what we just heard. So the reason that you are praying, verse 12, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, is because, verse 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sound countenance, a sad countenance. 
And in other words, what he's saying is, you haven't got the forgiveness yet. You're just a bunch of people who have followed me because of the miracles I did. And you say that you believe in me, so I'm giving you three chapters of sound doctrine to show you that you need to trust in God to give you the kingdom and trust in God's righteousness, that God will impute it to you as opposed to you following a bunch of rules and regulations from the Jewish religion. So that's why he says, follow it and do unto the end. And if you don't forgive men in your trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. But if you look over in Ephesians 4, which is doctrine for today, you don't see Jesus saying, for if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Rather, we see Paul saying in Ephesians 4, 32, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Paul tells us, God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 15, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So the audience of Ephesians 4 already has forgiveness. The audience of Matthew 6 does not. And we went over that last time about how we are already seated together with Christ in heavenly places. How we've already received the atonement. How we've already been justified by faith. The disciples in Matthew 6 were not in that position yet. They were not even called apostles yet. They had not been separated out from the people who say they believe to the people who actually believe. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5-7, through 7, is doing just that. That's why I don't understand when people will say, well, we need to follow what Jesus says in Matthew instead of what Paul says in his epistles. Well, God is speaking in both. It's just God has a different message under Jesus and Matthew than he has for today under Paul. And the message for us today under Paul is a lot better because we've already received forgiveness. Whereas Jesus' message was, you don't have it yet. You haven't separated yourselves out yet by believing the gospel. So I'd much rather have my sins already forgiven, as Paul tells me in Ephesians 4.32, than having to wait because I haven't been separated out as someone who is a true believer yet in Matthew 6. Uh, but man likes to follow the red letters because then you can put guilt on them, condemnation, and get more money out of them and service that way. So that's why it's done. But the truth of the matter is we have atonement now, Romans 5.11. We have been justified by faith now, Romans 5.1, and the verses that we went over last time. So um, the points on your outline about Matthew 7.1, judge not that ye be not judged, the first one is Jesus is talking to his disciples before the twelve were called. And then the second point, Jesus had not committed himself to them yet. Why? Because they had not yet received the atonement. And that's what we see from Matthew 7, 1 and following. So Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote uh, out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rent you. What you see from these six verses is, judge not that ye be not judged, is the context is these people have not received the judgment of God yet, meaning they haven't received the gift of eternal life. We talked last time about in Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And we showed from Scripture, from Romans 5 and Romans 6, that for us today in the dispensation of grace, we've already died, spiritually speaking, and Christ's blood has atoned for our sins. 
and we have already been judged. That's why we've been justified. The only way you can be justified is a judge declaring you just. And God, as judge, has done that by the blood of Christ being applied to our sins. So our judgment in terms of salvation, I realize there is a future judgment seat of Christ with regard to rewards that 1 Corinthians 3 goes over. But in terms of where our soul is going to be for all eternity, for those who have trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sins, that judgment has already taken place. They have been justified now. Now being justified by His blood. We have now received the atonement. We are now seated together with Christ in heavenly places. That judgment has already taken place for us. But in Matthew 7, since Jesus is talking not to believers, he's just talking to a group that says, I'm your disciple. And they only say it because they saw all these miracles. I mean, pretty much anybody, if someone was genuinely healing people of physical terminal diseases, you know, just snapping his fingers and it's done, and people know that's what's going on, the whole world's going to follow that person. But if he says, whoever will lose his life shall save it. Whoever will lose it for my sake shall save it. Well, I followed you because you heal people from cancer. But you're telling me I may have to give up my life for you? Bye-bye, mm, we'll see you later. I got what I wanted out of it. I got healed of cancer. Now I'm going to go back to my own fleshly living. That's how most people are. And that's the group that he's talking to. So when he says, judge not that ye be not judged, understand that these are not saved people he's talking to. There are some people who are believers, 11 of the apostles there, not Judas Iscariot. Um, there may be as many as 200, probably not that many, probably more like 100 at the most of the thousands who are here are actually going to be true believers. But he says there, to them. He says, judge not that you be not judged. If you don't want God to send you to hell, then what you need to do is get out of your own self-righteousness and trust in God to give you his imputed righteousness. That's what the rest of the passage talks about when it says in verse 3, when it says verse 2, with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Basically, it means if I say, I am righteous because of like the Pharisee does in Luke 18. And he says, I fast twice, twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess. And I am not as other men are. If that's the judgment that I have, then God says, well then I am going to judge you according to that as well. And I'm going to say, okay, are you sin free based on your own righteousness? And the answer God is going to come up with everybody is no. Because your own righteousness is as filthy rags. Therefore, he will have to send you to hell. Verse 3, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? People are unsaved. If they've already been justified, if they've already received the atonement, if they've already become children of God, then they don't have a beam that is in their own eye, because the blood of Christ cleanses them from that sin. But if they have a beam that is in that, their eye, that means they are following, in this case, the Jewish religious system. And they are like the Pharisees. And they're saying, well, I go to the synagogue every Sabbath day. I give the sacrifices and I give money in the offering. Or I get whatever the, the people there tell me to do, I do that. Not as a faith response to the Old Testament Mosaic law, but to look good to other people. Jesus just said in... Uh, in chapter 6, he was talking about those self-righteous people. He said in verse 2, Matthew 6, 2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. God's not going to give them a place in the kingdom because of that. Verse 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. So when you're in Matthew uh, verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites. He says at the end of that verse, they have their reward. Verse 19, he says, Lay not for your, up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Verse 24, he says, No man can serve two masters. You either serve God or you serve mammon. 
And then he says, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so if you do that, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then the result is, Matthew 7, 1, you are going to judge not. You're not going to say, I'm better than everybody else because I give alms, Matthew 6, 2. Or I'm better because I pray standing in the synagogues, Matthew 6, 5. Or I'm better because I fast, as you can see by the sad countenance on my face, Matthew 6, 16. He's saying, those are those self-righteous people of the Jewish religious system. And if you are part of their system, rather than believing God and His Word, then you are going to be judging other people. Because whenever you do that, when you say, look at how great I am, the implication is I'm going to be in the kingdom because of what I've done. Therefore, you are not going to be in the kingdom because you haven't done the things I have done. So that's why he says there in Matthew 7, 3, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye? Why are you telling him he needs to fast, give tithes, go to synagogue? When... You've got a beam that is in your own eye. You're unrighteous yourself because your self-righteousness is as filthy rags. Verse 4, How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine own eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So how are you going to see clearly? You have to believe the gospel of the kingdom. You have to abandon your own self-righteousness. So it's a call. It's not telling people today, you can't judge me, you got to tolerate me, because judge not that you be not judged. This is a message given to a group of people who have claimed that they are Jesus' disciples based upon physical miracles they have seen. And Jesus is saying, you don't have the atonement yet. I haven't trusted myself to you. Because I know what's in the heart of man, that it's deceitful and it's desperately wicked. So I'm going to give you sound doctrine, and then we're going to see if you're willing to suffer for my namesake. Are you going to say like Simon Peter, Lord, who do we go to? Thou alone hast the words of eternal life. Or are we going to say, ah, you heal my bum knee, I'm fine, I'm going to go back to serving my flesh. Most of the people did the latter, not the former. So these chapters here are to separate those people out. And we saw the difference then in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. They're still waiting for the Father to forgive them of their trespasses. But for us today in the dispensation of grace, we have already believed the gospel. And Ephesians 4, 32 says, We forgive others not in order to be forgiven because we've already been forgiven. We've already received the atonement as we went over last time. So, in Romans 5, 11, and the whole Matthew there, and we went over these verses last time. In Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We already have been justified by faith. We've already received uh, peace with God. Verse 9, Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be safe from wrath through Him. We've already been justified by his blood. Verse 11, not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We've already received the atonement. We went over last time in Ephesians 2. And verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So these verses tell us that once you believe the gospel today, you're justified now. You receive the atonement now. You've already been declared not guilty. God has says, Jesus' blood atones for your sins. I'm giving you the gift of eternal life. And I'm raised, and just like Jesus Christ, he was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Therefore, when Jesus Christ raised from the dead, our old man is crucified with him. We are buried with baptism into Christ, as Romans 6, 3 through 4 says. And so when Christ rose from the dead, we rose with him from the dead. And the result is, we already have the gift of eternal life. We are already seated together with Christ in heavenly places. We are already in a position of judgment. So going back to Matthew 7, 
when Jesus tells the crowds in verse 5, Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thy, out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. For us today in the dispensation of grace, if you've already trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, then verse 5 has already taken place for you. The beam that is in your own eye, your own self-righteousness, has been cast out of your eye by the blood of Christ. And you've been given the Spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, the Holy Ghost, and God's perfect preserved word for you, so that you can now see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So I mean, Jesus is saying in Matthew 7, 5, he says, basically, if the beam that is in your own eye is cast out, then you're going to see clearly to cast out of the moat, cast to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. And as we saw from Romans 5 and 6 in Ephesians 2, the being, spiritually speaking, that is in our eye, which is our self-righteousness, which is trusting in our own works to save us, has been cast out of that eye through the blood of Christ, justifying us by faith. And now, through the Holy Ghost and God's preserved word and the mind of Christ that we've been given, now we can see clearly to cast the beam, or cast the moat out of thy brother's eye. Now we have the spiritual perspective to say, this is what's wrong with this other person because I can see clearly now because the blood of Christ has shown me. And so judge not that you be not judged just doesn't apply to us. We talked about last time, John 8, the story of the... This verse in Matthew 7 is very similar to what we saw last time in John 8. In John 8, there is... Uh, in verse 3, the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him, that's Jesus, a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And Jesus told them in verse 7, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Basically, that statement in John 8, 7 is a parallel to Matthew 7, 1 through 5. He says, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. It's very similar to Matthew 7, 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Basically, what Jesus is saying in John 8 is that these scribes and Pharisees that have brought this woman in adultery to him are still with sin. They have not received the atonement yet. The blood of Christ has not given them the gift of eternal life yet. For Israel, that doesn't come until Jesus' second coming. So all of those people that are before him have sin. He says, if you are without sin cast a stone at her. In other words, judge not that ye be not judged. If you've already received God's judgment and he's given you the gift of eternal life by the blood of Christ to the point that you are without sin, because that's the only way you can be without sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way any of us are without sin is that we've believed the gospel and the blood of Christ has atoned for our sins. So he says, if you are without sin, which none of them were, um, their atonement doesn't come till the second coming. He says, if you're without sin, in other words, if the blood of Christ has already justified you and given you the gift of eternal life, then you are raised together with Christ in heavenly places and you are sitting in a point of judgment, spiritually speaking, where you can look at that woman because now you've got the spiritual eyes to see that if she should receive judgment or not. And then if you, since you're without sin, recognize that she then should receive judgment, go ahead and judge her. It's basically, that's the meaning of he that is without sin among you. Let him first cast a stone at her. But as we mentioned last time, we in the dispensation of grace are already above the law. We are according to the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, not the law of sin and death. We've already received the atonement. We are already seated together with Christ in heavenly places. That's why 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, he that is spiritual 
you've got spiritual life in Christ judgeth all things. We are already seated in a place of judgment. But for unbelievers, they're still subject to God's judgment. They've got that beam in their eye and they can't see clearly to cast the mote out of the other person's eye. As I mentioned last time, if a judge is a mass murderer and he is found guilty of that, he has no right to judge somebody who has come before him who is a murderer. He needs to recuse himself. Jesus says in John 8, 44, that the Pharisees are of their children, the devil, they are children of the devil, and the lust of their father they will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Spiritually speaking, all unbelievers are murderers, or at least they're liars, because they're of Satan, the father of the lie. And so they're not able to judge. So when someone says, you have no right to judge me, you need to tolerate me, that's why 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, after it says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things, it says, Yet he himself is judged of no man. Because I am seated together with Christ in heavenly places, and an unbeliever is dead in his trespasses and sins. He has no right to judge me by saying that I can't judge him. By contrast, I have every right to judge that unbeliever. Because he is dead in his trespasses and sins, or I am raised together with life in Christ. So, when you're reading Matthew 7, 1 through 5, this isn't a statement, and that's why I spent a lot of time going over the background of Matthew 5. This is not a statement to believers. Because people fail to rightly divide the word of truth, they think every red letter of Jesus is to us. And they think we need to follow Matthew 5-7 through 7 as the Christian constitution. And what we've seen today at the beginning of this lesson is that Matthew 5-7 through 7 is a sermon to a bunch of people who say that they are believers, that they are following Jesus. And Jesus is giving them sound doctrine to see if they will follow him or not. And so the statement, judge not that ye be not judged, means... You have not been given eternal life yet. The atonement has not taken place for you yet. And so your judgment by God is still future. And if you judge people based upon the flesh, then God is going to judge you based on the flesh because that's what you're trusting in. And you're going to end up in hell. But if you already have the atonement, as we talked about last time that we do, God has already judged us by giving us life in Christ and giving us the Holy Ghost. So now we have the right, even the obligation, to judge others. And we'll go into next time, we'll talk about how to judge. We'll talk about that. Uh, this time, though, I wanted to close with this last statement. Jesus has committed himself to us today. So we're in a different dispensation. The reason that, Ma basically, Matthew 7, 1 Judge not that ye be not judged. And 1 Corinthians 2.15, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. There are two reasons that um, they say two different things. One is that 1 Corinthians 2.15 is talking to believers. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, and verse 2, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. He says in chapter 3, verse 3, For ye are yet carnal. He's looking at the Corinthians and he says, You guys behave just like a bunch of unbelievers. And so the first thing I needed to understand is, Are you a believer or not? If you're not a believer, then I can tell you, Judge not that you be not judged. But if you're a believer, which you are, then I can tell you, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. So he says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Which basically means all unbelievers are on the judge not that ye be not judged verse. But then verse 15, he that is spiritual, meaning all believers, judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So the first reason that 1 Corinthians 2.15 applies to us today but Matthew 7, 1 does not, 
is because Matthew 7, 1 is talking to people who had not received the atonement yet. And 1 Corinthians 2, 15 is talking to people who have received the atonement. And since we have received the atonement, 1 Corinthians 2.15 is to us, and Matthew 7.1 is not to us. And the second reason is the timing of the atonement. For us today in the dispensation of grace, we receive it the moment that we believe the gospel. But for Israel, as we read earlier in Matthew 10.23, they do not receive it until the end. They have to endure until the end. They don't receive it until Jesus' second coming. So for those two reasons... Judge not that ye be not judged does not apply to us today. It applies to unbelievers. We have already had, by the blood of Christ, we have already had the beam that was in our eye, own eye, which is our self-righteousness, was cast out by the blood of Christ. And it's been replaced by a clear view. Paul says over in 2 Corinthians 4, to give you an idea, for those unbelievers... He says in 2 Corinthians 4, Second Corinthians 3, he's talking about Israel, he says in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 3, 14, that their minds were blinded for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Because of their unbelief, Paul is saying, the veil of the Old Testament is still over their eyes, and they can't see clearly to judge, just like the beam in your own eye. But today, for us who have believed, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You can see in verse 6 of chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4.6, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So unbelievers, they've got the veil. For the Jews, it's the Old Testament. For people who go to church and haven't believed the gospel, it's the veil of churchianity. But all unbelievers have some kind of veil over their eyes where they cannot clearly see, which is why 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man discerneth not the things of the Spirit of God. But for believers, it says that veil is taken away, and we all with open face behold the glory of the Lord, and we're changed to His image, because we've got the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We can see clearly. So since we can see clearly, we can judge people. So judge not that you be not judged is an excellent statement and is true for unbelievers. But 1 Corinthians 2.15, he that is spiritual judgeth all things, is an excellent statement and is true for all believers. So when someone says, judge not that you be not judged, let them see the rest of the verse. And you say... Well, from verse 5, Matthew 7, 5, Jesus says, If I cast out the beam out of my own eye, then I shall see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. So isn't he saying that I can judge if I've got the beam out of my eye? That's what the verses say. Well, I've already been justified. I've already received the atonement. I with open face behold the image of God and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the beam has already been cast out of my eye. And therefore, we can use Matthew 7, 5 to say that I can judge now. And we can confirm it with 1 Corinthians 2, 15, that he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now, the final point I wanted to cover. Uh, yes? I just wanted to add, I don't know if you were going to go ahead and say this or wait till the end, but um, I, I pulled out a, is it Living Bible or New Living Bible in the Message book. It's not even a Bible. Um, and I looked up 1 Corinthians 2.15. Uh, no, looked up uh, Matthew 7.1 and 1 Corinthians, I think, 2.15. The newer versions do not have the word judge in there. They have changed it to criticize. And I told Eric, I said, 
criticizing and judging are two different things. And so if you hear somebody or see somebody post something that says, oh, you don't have a right to judge, or if they come up to you and say, you don't have a right to judge, I would ask them, I would say, can, can you get your Bible out and show me where that is? Where it says, you, I don't have the right to judge? Well, I know where it's at. Well, show it to me. And I bet you anything, number one, they don't know where it's at because churches don't use the Bible anymore today. Number two, in their new versions, it says criticize. It doesn't say judge. So even if they did show it to you, I would say it doesn't say anything about judging. It says criticize. And they would, of course, you know, either way they're going to get mad. But the thing is, they have watered down the Bible so much that I think they just hear their speaker tell them, oh, we can't judge people. Well, that's not even in their, in their version. Their, you know, their so-called Bible version or in their book, whatever they're using. The word judge is not in there anymore. It's criticized. So, you know, you might have a leg to stand on if you come across somebody face to face and they say, oh, you can't judge. I'll be like, yeah, I can. No, you can't. I'll be like, show me in your Bible where it says I can't judge. And they're not going to, I guarantee you, they won't be able to show it because the word judge is not in there. But they don't even know where it is themselves. So there you go. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's a good point. Lana um, mentioned that and I wanted to bring it up, but I just, I forgot all about it. It shows you that in those modern version writers, they're not trying to give you the truth of God's word. They're trying to give you doctrine of their own philosophies. And so they don't even understand that we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now and in a position of judgment. That the things of heaven are so far removed from their mind that they're only thinking of the things of the world and they're not thinking of this judgment thing. And I know over in Hebrews it mentions for you know Israel about how this is a spiritual thing that you're you're dealing with here when you're dealing with the book with, with the Bible you know over in Hebrews 12 verse 18 or verse 22 Hebrews 12 22 ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And we're not talking about material things when you've got the Bible. We're talking about spiritual things. And you are going to have to stand before the presence of, now it's a little different for Israel here in Hebrews, but look at what you got heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels, general assembly, church of the firstborn, God the judge of all, spirits just made, made perfect, Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and the blood of sprinkling. This is a place of judgment where you should fear and tremble that you are before that because verse 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. But these modern versions, they don't believe in heaven, they don't believe in hell, they don't believe God's going to judge them. And so they look at these verses from a material perspective, and when they're in Matthew 7, 1, they don't say, oh, judge not lest you be judged, or judge not that you be not judged. They say, well, don't criticize people, because they're not even thinking that they're going to be subjected to some kind of spiritual judgment. I'm trying to look at it. See, see if you can find it in there. This is the message. Well, the message, a lot of times they don't give verse. I oh, know. Well, at the top it says, at the top of their book, it does. Oh, I see it up there. Yeah, they yeah. don't give verse numbers. They they really want to confuse you. Now I'm trying They to... do say God is a... It's a city where God is judged with judgments that make us just. But it doesn't say God is judge of all. No, but what's bad about it is it says the, the text over in Hebrews 12 tells you... Um, I'm looking in the living right now while he's doing that. You're trying to figure out. What, I just want to see if they actually took out, you know, the new versions, if they took out um, God as judge of all. And I think that's what they're 
doing? Well, in Hebrews 12, he says, basically, you haven't come to Mount Zion, but you've come to heavenly Jerusalem, to God the judge of all. And what they've done in the living, or in the Message Bible, is they say, it is the city where God is judged with judgments that make us just. So what they've said here is that we're all saved. God has, yeah, he's the judge, but he's made us just. Oh, what does this one say? And that's not what it says in the King James. He says he's the judge of all, and you better be aware that God is a consuming fire. That's this is living. the living translation. Yeah, that's the living. Hebrews 12, 23. To the church composed of all those registered in heaven, and to God who is judge of all. Oh, so living wow. So they they, they did, did put it in there. They did get okay, it right well there. the message, and there is a a so called, I'll say a building, it's not a church, that is around us and we found out on their website they only use the message Bible. That's all they use. And so that just tells you right there how bad it is. Well, the Message Bible in that verse has preaches universal salvation. That God makes us all, in His judgment, He makes us all just. And actually, Hebrews 12 is a warning that God is a consuming fire. So you better believe what He says or else He's going to consume you. And they take out the word consuming in the Message Bible in Hebrews 12, 29. Okay, our final point uh, toward the beginning of this message. I mentioned John chapter 2. And verse 24, it said, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And the great thing about us today in the dispensation of grace, once we believe the gospel because we have already received the atonement, our final point is that Jesus has committed himself to us today. He's given us his blood. He's given us eternal life. And he's given us his spirit so that we can understand the things of God. Look at Ephesians 5. The way he committed himself to us today is by dying for us. Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's his death. I mean, that's a full commitment. You know, if you say, I want you to commit to playing for this football team, okay, maybe I sign the contract and you give me the money and I commit to it. But if I commit to the point where I give my life for that football team... There can't be a greater commitment than that. Jesus Christ has committed to us, and then he gave his very life to save us. And not only saving us, he doesn't stop there, but verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but if that should be holy and without blemish. So Christ gave himself, he fully committed to us by dying on a cross, giving us salvation. And then he has fully committed himself by sanctifying us by God's word. You turn over just a couple pages to Philippians 1.6. For all the saved people, it says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he's already given you the atonement. He's already justified you. And now Jesus Christ is sanctifying you with the washing of the water of the word. And we can rest assured that he who has begun a good work, begun the sanctification process, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that we will be, as Ephesians 5.27 says, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then finally, Colossians 3.3, which we mentioned last time. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God, which shows the complete transformation of us, that Christ will have us sanctified before the Father because we are phys uh, spiritually uh, dead, crucified. The old man has been crucified with Christ. Uh, the body of sin is destroyed, and so then our life is hid with Christ and God so that when, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory, showing the complete transformation not only are you saved, but you're also sanctified. You're going to be holy and without blemish before God because Christ gave his blood to save you and he's washed you with the water of the word to sanctify you. And so again, showing the contrast between us today and the dispensation of grace, already received the atonement, already seated together with Christ in heavenly places, therefore we are spiritual and we are to judge all things. 
as opposed to Matthew 7, 1, people who Jesus hasn't committed himself to them yet because they haven't shown that they're believers. They may be following him only for the physical things that he gave them. And so he told them, judge not that ye be not judged. If you're judging now, then you're self-righteous. And if you're self-righteous, because you haven't received the atonement yet, your judgment is based on who you are. And since you're still dead in your trespasses and sins because you haven't received the atonement yet, then you're judging a judgment of man. And then, cry, and then God is going to judge you into hell as a result. As opposed to us today, if we're spiritual, if we've believed the gospel, and we judge according to God's word, then that's a just judgment. And we should do that. Because we are not dead in our trespasses and sins, but we are seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for the blood of Christ that atones us, forgives us of all our trespasses, and blots out that handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us, taking it away, nailing it to your cross. We thank you for doing that and giving us the gift of eternal life. Help us to trust in your word and allow the Holy Ghost to teach it to us so that we will be sanctified and holy without blemish, so that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we have a gift of gold, silver, precious stones. We have a reward based upon good works that were when Christ did through us because we trusted in your word. And help us to judge others according to a righteous judgment, according to your word, whether they are in Adam or in Christ, and judge accordingly so that others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so since we know that we can judge, next time we're going to talk about how we judge, how that works. So join us then.